The first thing I like to do uh, when I'm caping the deer out, or the deer's already been caped out, and you're wanting to cut the rest of the skin off for a good shoulder mount, I want to make sure these two legs are pretty well lined up. The deer kind of on that side. There's the brisket. And I line the legs up. And I'll make sure to cut just a little bit more than what I need in case the, you know, some of these newer forms have a lot more shoulder and everything. I'd rather have too much skin than not enough. So I'll come back here and just cut. Actually, I already cut it. And it had legs on it. I cut the legs off. Here's the legs. They can make good gun rack mounts. So I'll line the legs up and make sure I cut straight down. And uh, look how much brisket I got left. I even still got the front legs. I have been known to cut right down between the white and the brown and then go all the way back. The white, between where the white and the brown meet to go all the way back. But the main thing is you leave all this for the, for the shoulder mount. Uh, because like I said, some of these newer ones have a lot more shoulder. Now with the sharp knife, what I'll do is I'll lift this lip up here. Now a lot of times, if they got rigor mortis and they're hard, their jaws hard open, the sharpening still works real good for prying that mouth open. You know, if they're a little bit frozen still, you can still get open up for your skinny mouth is what I'm getting at. And I'll lift back here and then I'll get my X-Acto knife and run. I'll leave as much of this lip, I guess you call it the, the, the inner lip, I get close to the teeth as I can, like right through here. And you can tell I already started, but just, and then I cut back so much on the cartilage, I'd rather have too much of nose cartilage than not enough. We can always, you know, later we can skin that stuff out, you know, with a knife. And a lot of times they use a, a, a good sharp knife of doing this. It doesn't have to be an exacto knife, but, <clears throat> but I want to get as close to the, the gum line is what I'm getting at. Get as close to the gum line as you can. So we'll have enough of this right here to tuck. And we actually split this. We get up under here and, and cut it and open it up. And that's what we tuck down in the grooves of our deer head mounts. So I like to leave plenty of this. I always end up cutting some off. But I still, just the way I got where I was doing it was cutting close to the gum line as possible. You work your way down to about as far as you can where the, where the upper and lower lip meet. Right there on the side of the jaw. Staying close to the gum line as possible, as close to your teeth as possible. You'll feel the bone underneath as you're, you're fleshing. Just stay as close to the gum line as possible. And feel free to work your way around a little bit more. You know, uh, like this. When you separate the skin, you'll see that white membrane that's, uh, that's connected to the bone. It connects the skin to the bone, that white membrane. That's where you run the edge of your blade of your knife. And takes it right off, see? I failed to mention about measuring. There's three measurements uh, McKenzie tends to use. Might as well show you that first before I completely skin the head out. First measurement is the eye of the nose. And you basically, I like to go from this way. And then go right there where the tear duct meets the eye and all the way to the end. And this is seven and a quarter. Okay, so that's our first measurement, seven and a quarter, which would be A. Well, you're going to get the guy that skins his deer out himself and he goes all the way up to the base of the skull. And it's going to happen. You can either go ahead and, and cake the deer out and then get your measurements by spreading them out. I'll try to show that to you later too. C measurement is this measurement right here. And I came out with an eight and a half. So eight and a half and down here was about like a 20. So that's what a, okay, that's the C measurement, the one right at the base of the school. And then the B measurement is like two inches down. And basically, I just, there's a C, and then I go down about two inches and get my B measurement. If you got like a lot of blood around the mouth area, borax is good. Uh, just, just mule team borax that you buy in the store. 
it's fine for getting rid of a lot of that blood. Um, you can use it when you're even, you know, around the lip line in the lip area if you got a lot of blood. It's a good drying agent, and it's also good for like ticks. I mean, they may crawl off or something, but they'll uh, they'll dry up. Borax is a real good drying agent, and it's a good preservative. You can preserve birds with it, which I do quite often. Now, right here at the bottom, I didn't skin this out yet. You can still get relatively close to the gum, see? And it gives you plenty of skin. And plus, you're going to flesh them out later. You get as close to the gum line as possible. It will help you out. Like right through here, even. Continue on around. You'll see that membrane. You just keep separating that membrane from the bone. Like you're skinning anything else out. You just keep bringing this on down. You'll get where you're cutting through a little bit of meat on the side of the jaw, but that's a that's all right. Just keep working him around. Now the skin is thin right here under the jaw. It's kind of thin there, so you gotta be a little careful. And once that blade goes over it, it just separates. See, it just kind of separates instantly. See, I'm already at the bone on the side of the jaw. Kind of strategically grab it where you can tug the skin, pull it down. It's coming on down. Working it around. Look at that. Coming right off. It'd be great if all animals were this easy to skin out. Just keep on bringing it around. And eventually you're going to work your way down to where the upper and lower jaw meet. Like right here in this corner. And I just keep working it along. Basically, yeah, right here at the gum line. Still want to be conscious that uh, there's some still skin still connected to the face or the skull. So I could help she go even further down. See, now I can go further down on top. Which I wasn't really for far enough down anyway. But what you do, you eventually work your way around to the tear duct. You know, we get to the inner part of the eye, the tear duct. See, I'm, I'm right here, the upper and lower jaw meet. And I'm still, I got all this. I'll end up cutting some of that off when I mount the deer. Easy as pie. I just rake the edge of my sharp blade and across it and it just comes right off. I like to feel an exacto knife doing this, but a lot of times I'll use my fleshing knife for it. I mean, it's good and sharp too. And so anything that's good and sharp is good for taking these guys out. Or uh, skinning the head out, getting it ready for fleshing. Just raking across that membrane, separating the skin. And it just kind of brag, brings it on down, just a little bit of pressure, you know, from your fingers even, is enough to. Keep on and going and, and going on down. A lot of blood while you're fleshing. It's not wrong to get a little borax you can put on there and you know it'll 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 dry up that blood or soak it up, I guess is a better word.
Now, if you feel like you've gone far enough down through here, I'm going to go down just a hair bit. Then now it's time to go ahead and make your incision and go from the back forge as far as skinning him out, which all we got to do is get past the eyes and then we're in good shape. So, let me just do a couple more passes here. Get it down real good. Nice and deep. A lot of times I'll go far enough back to even start on the eyes a little bit. A lot of times when I put a hole in, in, in the tear duct, which is not uncommon. There's the tear duct. Just turn him around. And what I want to do, sorry this is a strange deer, but from the back, I want to visualize a V. You can almost see the hair pattern makes it on a deer. So you got that little hair pattern thing. That almost makes your V for you. But from the back center, you want to think of this as the center. Um, kind of like this. Now, I'm not measuring anything, just using this as a straight edge. Now, a lot of times, from like the back center, you go this way. I do like that. I guess what I do is a Y incision. I'll go back from the center right there, then back from the center of the burr right there. The center of the burr on both sides to where they meet and, and make your, your typical V. And then I go down a little bit. And that is for your, I guess, a Y incision. The Z incision, which I, I don't use it, but I might have used it once or twice. But basically what it does, it goes up behind one burr and then goes straight across. And either way works because there's so much hair up here. I guess an incision right through there would probably be not a bad idea. But I tend to do the V and go down the least amount of length that I can go. On this one, because he skinned it out so close up, then there's not going to be much of an incision at all. And I'm just going to be able to pull it forward. A lot of times I have trouble getting the skin over the nose. So I end up having to make my Y incision, you know, go down so far. But a lot of people, they get the hair down far enough and then go ahead and saw the antlers off with a cape still on it. And that means you have very little incision back here because the skin just slides right off. And basically all you're doing is cutting around the, the, the antlers, the burrs of the antlers. And you're basically just cutting around those and making your little V incision. And that can stop about right here because they already went as forward as far as they can and they cut the antlers off. I tend to do the Y incision and it's what I think most people do. You get a good sharp knife. On here, the exacto knife, uh, the blade's a little bit too little for me to contend with. So I get my flesh in line, knife, or what I skint the, the deer out with. And I'll go back, oh, I'd say about right here. Now, a lot of times I can just give it a tap like that, and uh, it gets up under the skin. And then I'm, I'm, I'm tickled with it. Make sure you're up under the skin. Well, I'm going to go ahead and use this exacto knife. This is the one I flesh my deer out. This is a usually a pretty sharp knife. You separate the hair and you see, you got to see where the angle of your blade's going. And you want it pointing right to the center of the burr. And just a good guesstimation is usually pretty good enough. And yeah, see, it's good and sharp. I'm using that area of the exacto knife that hadn't even been used. You can see how it's cutting up under that skin. You don't want stitches showing on the side of your deer, in other words, like because you were a little bit sloppy with where your incisions were made. That's a no-no. So I know I got that one. And I go back down to where I started my V again. Is way down here. And I make sure all the skin is back like it was. Make sure the point of my blade is facing towards the center of the burr. And then I start the same thing again. Start right in the center. And you can feel it going up under the skin. And a lot of times you can just do it like this. 
You don't want to cut yourself, that's for sure. A good long pointy knife is best. But basically what I'm doing, I can actually, now the reason you cut it from underneath is you do less hair damage. And in turn, your seam is not gonna show near as much because you hadn't cut through hairs to make your incision. So a lot of times I can hold back here even and make sure everything is lined up good. And I can do it like this. And I just lift it up. The blade is so sharp that it's cutting through that skin, you know, without completely coming out of the skin, which is why I like using a big, a big long knife. But an X-Acto knife will work. See how it's separated? And uh, I'm not all the way at the burr on this side, but you can start making things easier on you by doing this. The, just skinning him out still. Get this one, guys, all the way to the end here. Get closer to the burr, the skin gets more tougher or waxier, I guess that's how you say it. But notice how I'm trying to get right at the center of the back of the burr. As, as good as I, I can within reason, you know. I make sure no skin is loose moving around, causing it. You know, causing me to get a false reading. And then I just keep on skinning up. That's done, and you go straight to the burr with it. Another good thing about the X-Acto knife, you can get so close up under that burr. I'll tend to go in and almost dig out just to make sure I get, sometimes I go in from the top of the burr, but I would rather go in from underneath for the purpose of not cutting any hair. Do the other one the same way. And I may want to go ahead and free the ears up a little bit. Borax will dry these ticks out. It's a real small one. I don't know if you can see. Even I'll even use a little drop of lacquer thinner on them, and it usually does the job. Just a little bit, just a drop of it. He's already dead. Now to free up where I can uh, do more digging up on top. Let me see what I can do here. See all that, you want to leave all that. All that hair where it goes right up against the burr. But there is some, a lot of times, some thick cartilage skin there underneath and you can see how it's coming off. See how it's coming off. I'll, I'll tend to dull my X-Acto knives a lot during this process because you're wanting to get all the, the skin off. A lot of times you can get real close to the burr, and uh, even if you leave a little bit of hair on there, as long as you tried and done a real good job, it ain't going to matter. So I come up from underneath, all that skin, so I don't know if you can see it right there, if that's what was around the burr. There we go. Okay, that's a good start on that side. So that's just coming forward. You're still, still getting that membrane, separating it from the skin for the most part. Look at that, that's all burr right there. That's he definitely done some damage. Now 
uh, separate. And that's almost as far as I can go without cutting the ears. But you can see, you can get down pretty far. See how I got down. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, skin down a little bit and, and cut through the ears. Loosen some skin up around the ears first. I go ahead and just take some more of this out, yeah. Now, the good thing, you do have a little bit of stretchability in the skin, so if you leave just a little bit of hair on the burr or something, it's not going to matter because you're, you're only going to be able to stretch the skin anyway. Get a couple of sweeps down here to get the process started, I guess is the right word. So, although I didn't get a good measurement, neck measurement yet from him it's uh gonna be a good now because so i'm gonna have a big seam in the back and then i can pull back and get a little bit of this here and make sure it's still separating. See the exact one I was having an advantage. No way you can get up under there and claw that skin out. Look at that. Coming right out. A little hard right here because uh, the, the way the antler goes right down to the he couldn't even bring one of his ears forward but you can carry this down a little bit further if you want to or go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and cut to the ears got my knife use sharpening steel on it try to get it sharp Every now and then you gotta use a grinding wheel to make sure it's good and sharp. Let's see, right now is a good time to try to cut through the ears. And it doesn't matter how much you leave. The main thing is you wanna you wanna leave some of the base of the ear. See, I'm cutting through the canal right now. So it don't take much. You don't want to accidentally cut through the skin underneath. But you can see them kind of I don't know if you can see that. There's the canal. Probably a good idea to go ahead and get some more of the skin off. This is just with my knife. See, so as long as you're underneath the skin, you're good. I'm going to come through here. You know, a good sharp knife or an exacto knife. That's fine. Make sure you get most, if not all, that hair from around the birds. What I'm getting at. And this will free you up for uh, skin your hair out a little better and all that. We're cutting the skin from around the bird and we're also freeing up skin so we can cut through our ear real good. As you're, see, I'm constantly getting more loose skin than I can work on because. You free up one spot, it gives you some, it relieves tension in another area. Now I can use my knife, and it cuts through all that stuff that's not really skin, but like gristle material, that the skin is kind of like really connected to. Uh, sorry about the bad view there. 
And a lot of times when I'm moving the deer head around, I'm conscious about this part being up, so I'm not rubbing hair off. And uh, sometimes you can't beat a good knife, though. It's getting that cartilage stuff. So I'm just kind of letting, letting the knife do its thing, using the, the skull as a leverage, and then coming up with it. Next thing you know, you're out from around your burr, see? For the most part. There you are, it's freed up, see? I can use whatever knife you got handy. Free up some of that space through here. Keep on a going, keep on trucking down. separating skin and if you leave a little meat on your skin that's why you flush them out anyway so got that yeah I got around the burr working my way down as far as I can without running into something but about three days or something like that and that is what killed them out Seems to do a better job than anything. And no one likes to have ticks crawling all over. I'm, I'm one of them. You'll know the air canal when you cut through it because it's, it's like a round hole. It's like a tube that you cut through. Uh, if I lay the skull up like this, I want to make sure you know this nose is up. You can do damage to deer if you're not careful with it when you're skinning him out. Now all that cartilage at the ear base, I cut through that. And there's the ear canal. I don't know if you can see it real good, but it's right there. So I've already cut through the ear canal. Now in the olden days, they used to cut them all the way down the middle and then just sew them back up. And a lot of times they had enough hair that you couldn't see it. But in modern times, you know, the taxidermists try to leave as little of an incision as possible. Keep freeing that up. If you do a bunch of them, you get it a routine. And I I used to do a lot of them. And I had a routine down where I was getting them down. I was getting them fleshed out really, really quick. I'll turn the deer around here where I needed to do it. To make sure I get him good. See the cartilage there? That's his ear canal. When you get to that, you know, you got your ear freed up. Let's keep going down. This guy didn't have any neck, so it's going to be real easy to kind of go go around him that way here's the ear canal again go ahead and free him up a little bit around his burr here flesh and not here. Yeah, you'll feel that waxy cartilage right before you get to the bone. You kind of feel it when you're not. But. Dig up, come up from underneath and uh, you'll see how, see how good of a job I'm doing around the burr of this deer. And then I go to the other side. And I also try to, when I'm skinning around the eyes, I'll show you that later. I don't want to rub hair off the eyes, which a lot of times it'll do if you're not careful. And you'll have like a deer with like areas where there's small hairs around the eye that they're uh, rubbed off. So I try to avoid 
doing that for sure. Okay, I'm cutting through the air canal. Bring me over and do a little bit more cutting here. Okay, once you skin down far enough, you'll see uh, you'll see where the tear duct connects. It's, it's kind of unmistakable. Um, it's not hard to cut through the tear duct. It's just more repair work for you. And the tear duct goes into the form anyway. So if you put a hole, it's just a little extra it's pinning, but and gluing. But uh, if you can keep from cut through the tear duct, that's even better. And some deer, the tear duct goes real deep, and some it doesn't go very deep, which is probably the reason why a lot of them accidentally cut through the tear duct. But I don't know if you can see it, but I'll... It's just where the skin is connecting, right here. It's the inside corner of the tear duct. And you just want to make sure... You know, if you, if you can dig out cartilage with the tear duct, which is good because that means that you've got the whole tear duct instead of cutting a hole in it. So just make sure you dig down deep into that groove there where the tear duct is. And, uh, you know, free other skin with you while you're at it. Here again, I usually do that just with my knife on skinning him out, you know. And just make sure I dig in there good enough to get his tear duct. The more you free up skin around the face, the more the more you have room to uh, do other things. Like skin the tear duct and all that other stuff. So you just kind of keep working on him. You'll get a routine down after a while. I've been out of practice for several years, so I'm a little bit slower than I would be if I was doing it every day. But you can kind of tell you know, where the tear duct is, where it starts, because it kind of grooves in real good. And you see I'm kind of cutting down into it right there. Yeah, that's the corner of the tear duct. Cut through it, it's just a little old canal. That's the main ear canal. Not only the canal, but the ear butt itself is a, is a separate piece of cartilage. And uh, so you don't just cut through the canal, you cut through the ear butt as well. It's two separate pieces of cartilage there. You just want to make sure you don't cut to the side of the face or anything, you know. Uh, make sure, in other words, you're sticking where the skin and the, the meat separate. It's kind of what I've done there. Depending on how much a uh, long incision is, depends on how much you got to go down as far as. See all this? Just keep going down. Look at that. All that fresh meat I can skin out.
And it, once you get the chance where you can actually twist him around like that, you're doing good. Now I can feel under my knife, I can feel the feel the, the, the eye burr. Right here is the back, I can feel the, the socket, the corner of the back socket, I can feel it. So I, I get my sharp knife and just pull real good. Because I've learned from experience that that's good enough. Um, I can even see the people. The fin is so skin right here. Or thin, sorry. The skin is so thin around this socket that I can actually see the eyeball. So I know I'm good as far as, you know, accidentally cutting through. See there I went through. That's just that thin membrane skin. A lot of pro taxidermists, they replace this in their mounts. You know, that little, they do, I mean, it's unbelievable. But let's see. See, I can actually see the corner of the eye. But you got to be careful when you're reaching there to feel to make sure you're separating the eye. You got little hairs around your eye. And when I first started skinning these deer out, I had a bad problem rubbing that hair off. So you just... Just want to be careful not to do that. Now what I'm actually doing is working my way down towards the tear duct. Sorry. A lot of times I'll make sure it's better to skin too much off than not enough. I just make sure this is in front so I don't. And I'm actually still in the socket at the very end corner where I'm making an incision because I'd rather do that than cut through a tear duct. Although it doesn't matter really if you do, I just. Now I can see here's a little bit of the tear duct right here. See, it's starting. And try to, you know, let it run on the bone and separate the skin from the bone. That's kind of what I do. This area is really easy to mess up, I guess. Although you never really mess up because you know, it's just more pinning. It goes inside on the deer too. Uh, a lot of times you can't really even see it. Depends on the deer. Some have tear ducts that you actually see them. And then some have it where you can't see it. And it's very hard to, to not put a hole in it. I don't think I put a hole in it, but even if I did, I'm not worried about it. I free some skin up and get ready for the other side. Now usually there's a lot of neck that we have to work around, which which basically just means a bigger incision at the bottom. But since this guy cut most of the neck off anyway, which is not the best thing in the world for it's not the best thing in the world for you know, getting a good measurement, but you're not going to have much of a seam in the end. That's for sure. Right here at the back of the eye again. Right where the eye orbit starts, you know, you can feel the bone.
down here at the back. As I cut that skin, I get where the, the skin starts pulling forwards. You know, plus, I, I mean, I'm applying a little pressure anyway, but see, I can see the eyeball. So I know I'm already good there. I can actually pick it up and, you know, the skin above the eyeball, not the eyeball itself, but the skin above it. Start my skinning process. Here again, freeing up skin that's maybe holding it down, keep me from, you know, maybe having a better, easier time to do it. Oops. Go ahead and rake my sharp knife over it and it just uh, pops it right off. Free me up all kinds of skin so I can work. This is the brow area. It's I'm pulling down right now by turning my knife over it. I see I can actually look in and see where the tear duct starts. I mean, I, I'm actually looking at it from the inside, but but I have too much and not enough. Super easy to cut into the tear duct. Super easy. I mean, you might as well accept the fact that if it, happen, if it does happen, no big deal. I'd say exactly not the best choice getting that tear duct off. Here it's coming. Can you put a hole? And pretty much as soon as you get that tear duct done. Right here, you see where some of the jaw muscle is? Go ahead and cut through that because we know we got plenty of lip where we cut. Now, unless it's open mouth, you want to be more conscientious about that. But since the majority of them are closed mouth, I probably even got enough for open mouth even. See, so still holding a little bit. A lot of times you can check it. Look at that. Here's where we cut. There's your jaw, jaw, where it connects to the bottom of the face. A little borax in there if you don't mark all the blood. Run that knife off of it. Here's some of that jaw muscle starting. Always end up cutting all that stuff off anyway. There's the neck. So a lot of times it'll hold like this too, but not this guy. Not this guy. So I've got that separated. Look at all that. He's going to be a closed mouth. I'll end up having to take all this off to about right to here. Same with this side. Now if it's open mouth, I might, I'd want to save all this. I want to get back as far as I could if it was open mouth. About right to there. See, if he was open mouth, I'd want all that. All the way to the back, even a little bit more, which I may have left on there. 
But since it's not going to be open mouth, all this can come off, see? That's why if you skin a deer out and then they decide they want to open mouth, you know, later afterwards, you could be in the you have a situation there. There's a good way to fold it to keep the keep freezer burn to a minimum. Straighten your deer out. Put the nose like that. Put one ear like that way, one ear like that. Then you roll him up. They got special bags you can use that you can buy uh, you know, through McKizzy. But then again, Walmart or Dollar General bag will work. And we'll mash all this out, especially if, you're not, if they're not going to be in the freezer super long anyway. And yeah, twist her up real good. And just tie her in a knot. I have used just regular garbage bags. This string that you you know you sew your deer deer head deer heads with. And other animals is usually strong enough. But I have even used like a borax box. Put enough room for a hole in there and then use this string. Write all your info down on there. Sometimes you want to put like eight point number one because you may not know the guy might kill another eight pointer and then you're confused later on when you try to mount them. So good records is essential. You can go by a number program, <clears throat> which is a good way. You know, still put his name on it and stuff, and then use like a number, and then get like a zip tie, and put it through. You get a hurricane come through, you know, just the winds from it. You know, they'll, uh, they'll find a way in your building and blow tags off and everything. So make sure you got a good setup, I guess is the right word, and put them in the freezer. Pay, if a person pays attention to the detail, they'll never run into that situation. Even if they're skinning 8 to 10 deer a day. As long as they got them numbered, then they can't get them mixed up. Yep, use whatever tag system you feel right with. There's just an old borax box with a hole put in it with an X-Acto knife. I got these. Zip ties help, especially on antlers. But this stuff is strong. This will work too. This is what you sew your deer heads up with. If you know you're going to be rummaging around in your freezer and you're afraid tickets may come off when you're trying to look for, you know, for somebody's uh, animal to mount, use a good old zip tie and a ticket that's reinforced right back in here where it won't ever pop off. So first and last name and how many points it is. Because you might get one guy that kills two or three different deer and they're all different points. Or they may all be the same point. So, you know, sometimes I'll put, I'll put a number on it. This one's number 35. It's real good record keep, keeping, and uh, you'll never mess your records up and have disappointed customers. Okay, basically that's what we've done. The dotted line shows you where the incisions are. Uh, we didn't even go as far as it shows in this diagram. So we, uh, there's not going to be much sewing, and of course you've got ears and cutting the cartilage. But you fold this skin back, you know, after you've gone, after you've caped him and the skull is already out. You can get a measuring tape and measure around the inside. You know, for your for your extra measurements. You know, if you get a cape to the mail or something, you can. Uh, one corner goes on one side of the incision, the other corner goes on the other side of this incision. And I would want you to stretch it a little bit to get a good accurate measurement. Because if you do it with a real loose, you're going to get a small deer form. You know, make sure you got a, a good eye measurement and the good all around. I forgot to show you before I put the other one in the freezer. But basically, you, you're measuring from the inside instead of the outside. 
and give it a little bit of stretch so you get a good measurement and that's how you can get your other measurements. Now the way I cut, cut my antlers off on my deer, I always usually tend to have more than not enough skull, which is always a good thing in case you have to trim it up. According to what form you use and all that, it can make a little bit of a difference. Like in between the eye, well, first of all, a lot of times I'll get a measurement like this just to see the center of the back corner of the eye to about the middle of this burr is oh, kind of messed up. Looks like about an inch and a quarter. But the good thing is, is we've got a good one on this side. And plus, the, we'll level the score with the school with the form. And that will also help you get a good idea how to set it. You know, if the school is level and your antlers are level, then you know you're in the right area. But this side tend to go down probably about the center of the burr from the side, about right here. And it's about, well, it's about the same, but this side's about an inch. I may even put a little bit of a mark there so I know where I took my measurement from. Yeah, right there. And that'll come off anyway. Looks like I left a little bit of hair right there on the skin. Well, in general, it tends to be about an inch and three quarters. Well, let's see what we got right here. We've got okay, from the back center of the eye should be about right back center. Should be about right here. Yeah, that's about right. And then uh, it's an inch and a half. Okay, so we got an inch and a half from there to there. Let's see what the other side is. From the back center of the eye, I'm just kind of guessing about right there. It never fails on me. And see how the burr is down so low? You can't hardly find the center of it. But it's, yeah, it's about the same inch and a half. So I'll mark that in my notes. My burr measurements, sometimes I'll do each side and, and put it in my notes. I'll literally, on, on his paperwork, I'll put eye to burr, inch and a half. And that's, that's what I'll tend to do. Or I might put right side, inch and a half, and the other side might be different. I'll put inch and three quarters. You know, we'll use that as an example. So now I'll know what I kind of need to be at. And the skin will match up real good. And a lot of times I'll just kind of eyeball it, but I'll go half and half, maybe a little bit more towards the eye, just to make sure I have enough skull if I need it. And I just eyeball it and cut straight down. Here I'm going to cut it through the school. Now when I go down at least halfway by, past the eye, I know I'm down far enough. And I'll find the, the, where the base of the school ends. Okay, yeah. Just about got it. It's about as good as it's going to get. Should be able to break it loose. It's barely holding. I think a little on this side, maybe. There we are. Then you just pop the brains out in the trash can. There you go. Your head goes in there. We got all our measurements from our burr to eye and all that stuff. Now comes the 
part where we take all the meat off the <clears throat> off the school. I like to go ahead and do it. I like to go ahead and get it done, and then hang it up in the rack, in the rafter, where whatever you use. Get it done while you're out here and you're working on it, and it's something you don't have to worry about later. It's just a good habit to get into. Just to go ahead and make sure you go ahead and get him. Or you're already working on him. Right here on the sides, there tends to be a lot of meat. Go ahead and start getting that off. That way later on when you're working on your deer head, you ain't gotta be trying to carve on him. You can just mount him straight up. He'll be good to go. But you get the idea. You just keep using borax and rubbing it on and kind of drying the skin out so you flush real good with it. You can even get up here around the burrs, you can take some of that, or I guess you could say it's more like cartilage than bone. You can get some of that off or get as much as you can get off. But I'll keep working on this. I'll show you what it looks like when I get done. Oh, also down here. A lot of times you can get just up under that and lift that up and it'll pop right out there. Let me see if I can do it. It's like a thin piece of skin, screwdriver or something. And it should just pull right out, see? There you go. And all that is is just bare bone with borax on it. I'm going to spray a little bit of water actually on it to help uh, so borax can cling to it. Just to help preserve it real good. So basically, get all the cartilage and meat off you can around the burrs, everything. Here, I'm getting all that's coming off. And it's basically right up against the bone. But I can get up in there and get some of that cartilage out. That's basically what it is, is cartilage. See, it's coming out nicely. This is where an X-Acto knife range supreme is right here. I have been known to use my exacto knife blade on a sharpening steel and kind of get an edge back on it even. Right there. All 
all that meat from up in here is coming off real good. Just a little bit right there. I get as much as I humanly can possibly get as far as that cartilage around the burrs. And when it dries, you might have to go back over it a little bit more to get some of the extra membrane off. But if you do it good now, you don't have to worry much about it later. And if you get cheaper brands of X-Acto knife blade, you know, from different companies, some of them, they just break. And you get a piece stuck in your eye or anything. So, if you use a blade, try to make sure it's an X-Acto knife blade. Unless you really know the company that makes the blades and had good luck with them. In other words, there's cheap versions of X-Acto knife blades that will fit your, your, your X-Acto knife. But they break and snap really. And it could be a hazard. I might even get a little bit of a little bit of water or something. You know, if I really want that borax to stay on there and soak in. Just get my borax put on there. We'll even kind of frost up a little bit later. After it sits for a while, it really, this is doing his job. Doing his job real good. Make sure it's good and damp and get that stuff on there. Later I'll get like a toothbrush or something and get all that junk off. Some kind of brush. And... A lot of times there's meat back here too. Make sure you get, get all that as good as you can. There's good and preserved. and preserved get behind a point or something so it won't ever fall off and keep your record straight um, even the form you know you might order a bunch of forms at one time and so you don't get them confused make sure you write the form number uh, the type of form that you bought what turn it is what size it is Put it on your paperwork. That way, if you get a bunch of forms in, you know, you'll know 
who's this who you meet you might get three or four different forms that are all the same size but at least you'll know who gets what they may all be you might get three or four of the same turn but if you keep your record straight you'll never have any trouble write down all your information on your paperwork everything I may have lost some footage but when this was connected to the school I went from the back center of the eye the the eye orbit the where the bone is and I put a mark there now I went to the center of the back of this bird and got a measurement of an inch and a half. I went to this side where the back of the eye, you can see a little bit of it right here. That might be good enough. Hold on. And then I put about where the center of the burr is, about right here. And then I went to where I made my cut. It's inch and a half is the back center of the eye. That measurement will come in handy when I mount my deer. In other words, I'm going to do some sawing on the school when I'm mounting the deer. That's obvious. And uh, he's a little bit messed up. But when I mount my deer, I'll know how far this burr needs to be from the back of the eye of the form. So I'm transferring my measurements from the school to the form. And this should lay flush with the top of the form since I ordered the right head size. And then you want to look from the side to make sure your pitch is right. And everything you know you don't want your antlers too far back or too far forward you want them just like how they were the skull will give you that little bit of extra information uh, the, the pitch of the skull you'll tell if it's not right and so all those measurements everything transfers over to my notes it's all on one sheet of paper so from start to finish I'll know who gets the right form what turn it is I got measurements for when I place a school. I've got good measurements, so it all comes it all, all comes into consideration. So that way you can't mess things up. Just hang them upside down the rafters.